we've got a lot to talk about uh, this morning in our first session, so I'm going to pray for us, and then uh, we'll uh, dig in. Father in heaven, I pray, Lord, that you would help me right now to serve my brothers and sisters who are in this room. Father, I pray that in the next few moments and even a couple hours as we talk about some of the practical things that happen inside of our marriage, Lord, I'm personally kind of overwhelmed at the amount of things we could talk about and just the reality that we have to pick some things and trust that your spirit will help us as we build our marriages on biblical principles. And Lord, I, I still want to pray, Lord, that you would use even sessions about sex or serving or community, and you would do more with those teachings than I can imagine, that you would that you would apply them to other areas of marriage, that your spirit would apply this to people's hearts, that you would illuminate passages that we cover in ways that would really serve everybody here. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would do that right now as we talk about sex and we talk about how to cultivate intimacy in marriage. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we ready to go? Oh, no, no problem. All right, let me get this on my ginormous head here, and uh, then everybody can hear me. You guys hear me okay? Okay. All right, let me just clip this back here. Um, well, let me start. I want to give you start by giving you a couple of scenes, okay? A couple of scenes that I want to set up what we're going to talk about this morning, okay? So scene number one. It's been a very long day at the end of a very long week. Uh, you've had work and kids. You've gone to church a couple of times, and you get to the end of the week, and you're just exhausted, and you finally have an evening in. Let's say it's been a couple of weeks since it's just been you and your spouse. You had an evening in. You don't have any big things to do, no big responsibilities, and you've just been looking forward. You're thinking about it at work. You've just been looking forward to relaxing when you, when you get home. And uh, if you're being honest, as you think about getting home, you'd prefer to interact with as few human beings as possible. Uh, you would honestly love to just relax and read a book or watch a movie or uh, just, just really kind of have some R&R. So you're doing that, and your spouse comes into the room, and they say, hey, um, what if tonight we dot, 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 and you know what's coming, but here's the deal. You don't want to. You don't, you don't want to be intimate tonight. You're tired. You don't want to do this. You panic. You want to say no, but you're like, I'm a Christian. Am I allowed to? Uh, how do I talk about this with you? Uh, what should you do in that moment? Okay, that ends scene number one. All right, let's start scene number two. You uh, are getting together with one of your close friends from church for coffee one morning, and after the normal kind of catch-up remarks, uh, you, you ask, hey, how are you doing? And you say, overall, we're doing pretty well. But um, then they kind of lean in. And they say, hey, um, can I talk to you about something that's like a little personal and private? And honestly, I feel a little uncomfortable, but I trust you and want to talk to you about this. Um, and they lean in. Sorry, I'm like working on this thing here. Okay. They lean in and they mention to you that their spouse and they have had a disagreement about what they can do in the bedroom. And they mention that their spouse wants to do something that they honestly feel a little uncomfortable with, but they don't actually know why they feel uncomfortable with it, and they're a Christian, and they want to honor the Lord, and they want to love their spouse, and they want counsel from you, and they ask you, uh, what do you think? What do you say inside of the coffee shop about what's allowed in the bedroom? <laughs> okay, that ends scene number two. Start scene number three. Scene number three is very easy to imagine because it's this moment right now. You're sitting in this room, and I'm up here about to talk to you about sex, and you're just a little bit uncomfortable right now. 
you're just wondering what I'm about to say to you. You're wondering what kind of detail we're going to have. You're wondering, is there going to be diagrams? What's about to happen? <laughs> uh, like, you're like having PTSD from like health education and freshman year of high school. And then you hear me say a little bit later that it's really important for you and your spouse to talk about sex practically together. And if you're honest, you've never really done that before. You have sex with your spouse irregularly, but you certainly don't talk about it. You get in the car and just a little bit, and you sit down in silence in the car next to your spouse, and you both know what I said, and you're sitting there and being like, okay, we're supposed to talk about this, but you're scared, and you don't know, where do we start? How do we start talking about sex together? How do we talk about this in a way that serves each other, but then also honors God, that has the appropriate level of discretion? We want to honor the marriage bed. Those are very real and very common situations that happen to normal Christian couples. Those, those situations happen to everybody in this room, most likely. Those aren't weird. You're not a freak. If those things have happened to you, many of you are in situations like this in your marriage right now. Living the metaphor of Christ and the church in marriage includes sex. We have to talk about this. We talked about this a little bit last night. Sex is a physical portrait of the covenant between you and your spouse. It also is this metaphor between believers and Christ. Two people become one in intimacy, and intimacy displays and strengthens the covenant of marriage when it's done by faith in Jesus to his glory. But honestly, intimacy is really complicated. You know this. If you've been married for more than like four hours, you know this, that intimacy is complicated. It's not what you think before you get married. Inside Christian marriage, there are a host of issues that are often not addressed inside the church about sex. We saw that in several scenarios I just gave you. It's the reason why some of you were giggling and smirking and moving uncomfortably in your chair while I said them. It's because this isn't something you're used to talking about inside of the church building. Uh, each of those scenarios, though, are normal. But here's the deal. If they're less left unaddressed, if they're left unaddressed in your marriage, they can actually develop into really major problems in your marriage. They can develop into problems that really distort the metaphor that you are called to display in your marriage. So what I want to do in this second session that we're having together is to speak biblically and plainly about sex to help us faithfully live out the metaphor together. And as an aside, I just want you to know... Um, that I, I'm going to keep all of this PG, okay? Um, I'm not, I have nothing to prove about how edgy I can be. That's, it's not helpful when people do that uh, in church settings. I'm not trying to prove anything. Um, I want to guard everybody's mind. I want to guard everybody's purity so you can relax. I'm not going to try to do something that you'll remember forever. Um, uh, <laughs> I, uh, but I do, but I do want to say this real quick as an aside. I am going to keep everything PG, but listen, some of you have sexual problems in your marriage, and you need to talk in more detail with one of your pastors, okay? So don't use this as like a reason to, to, to not go into detail with your specific situation with Christian couples that can walk with you and serve you. Um, you should be honest and open if you're really having trouble in your marriage sexually, uh, and I want to encourage you to talk to your leaders about that. So here's what I want to do. Here's how I want to do this. I want to ask four questions, okay? Four questions about sex that I think you must answer if you're going to have any hope of navigating those scenes that I just laid out for you, okay? I think that if you can answer these four questions that I am about to ask biblically, if you can answer those questions biblically, you will be able to navigate most sexual issues in your marriage with biblical clarity. So let's overview these questions together. Here's the first one. The first question you need to answer is, what are 
your principles about sex? What are your principles about sex? Many of you will be familiar with the biblical purposes of sex. We kind of briefly touched on these last night, um, but I just want to review them one more time so we're just all on the same page. What does the Bible teach about sex? The purposes of sex. Um, And the reason I I want to hit on these so hard is because your principles about sex are going to deeply impact the way that you're going to address problems in your marriage with sex. Okay, so the principles have to be clear. So um, four purposes, biblically, of sex. So first, uh, babies. That's the first reason people have sex, and and the Bible teaches uh, the sexual relationship uh, exists. So let me read a couple of scriptures here. Genesis 128, we looked at this yesterday. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then again, Genesis 2, 24 and 25, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh and the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. So first purpose is to be fruitful and multiply, have babies. Second purpose, to display and strengthen the covenant of marriage. To display and strengthen the covenant of marriage. We touched on this just for a moment last night. Paul tells us in Ephesians 5.22 and in the following verses that when the two become one flesh, that yes is a, a bigger spiritual reality that God makes happen, but it's also a physical reality that is being talked about, one fleshness. It's talking about intimacy. It's talking about sex. Uh, the bodies come together together. And it's incredible. It symbolizes what is true about this couple. It symbolizes what is true. True, two people become one flesh, and this union of marriage, which includes sex, symbolizes Christ's relationship with the church. But it doesn't just put it on display. It's not just a picture of it. It also strengthens the covenant. Another passage we don't have time to read, but you should read, is 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 5. Paul tells Christian couples to regularly have sex. He commands them, if they're married, you need to regularly have sex. He actually says it's basically spiritual warfare to keep temptation away. But also, it's strengthening your covenant. That's what sex does. Third purpose of sex is to enjoy it. (laughs) Pleasure. Proverbs, Song of Solomon, there are celebrations, long, extended, uncomfortable meditations and celebrations of erotic love in the Bible between married couples. The Bible is procreation, pro-body, pro-sex. And don't let anybody in the culture tell you differently. The Bible is pro all of those things. God has given it, given this world, this gift called sex to be enjoyed in the context of marriage. And lastly, last purpose, just to make this explicit, the last purpose of sex is to glorify God. 1 Corinthians 10.31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, I love that that's in there. So you can include sex here. Whether you eat or drink or have sex, do all to the glory of God. So all the other purposes of sex are subordinate to that goal, the glory of God. You should be thinking, how can my sex life bring glory to God? That is the true north of all things and the point of human life and existence. So I imagine that's review for most of you. Uh, That Maybe you wouldn't list them like that, but it'd be something down that line. You understand that those are the purposes for sex. Here's why this is so important. Your principles or your convictions are your deepest held beliefs, okay? We talked about this last night, that there is a difference between saying, theoretically, I know that those are the purposes of sex, and there's another thing, another, another dynamic of what it actually means to live inside of those principles. This is my world. This is what I believe. These are my deepest held beliefs. This, this is what the Bible would call the heart 
This is your deepest belief, controls your thoughts, controls your values and your decisions. And this, this actually shapes your expectations in your marriage for your sexual relationship. Another way I said this last night is that your principles have you, you don't have your principles. Okay? So, so what do you believe about sex shows up in the way you talk about it, in the way, if you're married, you do it. What you believe about it shows up. These are the biblical purposes of sex. And if these are truly your principles about sex, you're well on your way to navigating even the most complicated issues about sex. We have to guard our hearts and guard our minds with God's word, particularly on the topic of sex. Our world is seeking to shape us, to change or distort what you believe about this, so we have to renew our minds regularly in the way we're talking about this. And here's the reason why it's so important to know your principles. Because your principles are going to shape your priorities. Okay? What do you prioritize when you are entering into the bedroom? I want to talk about that for just a minute, and that leads to the second question that you need to ask. So the first one is, what are my principles about sex? The, the, the second is, what are my priorities for sex? What are my priorities for sex? Your principles lead to your priorities, okay? So when you're thinking about intimacy with your spouse, the things that you want or the things you desire, the things that are most important that happen, that reveals what you believe about it, okay? It reveals, your expectations reveal what you believe about it. Um, for example, the primary principle operating inside of the conception that the world has about sex is maximum individual pleasure. That is the operating principle in the way that our world thinks about sex. Maximum individual pleasure pleasure, and that leads to selfish priorities in sex, doing what I want to do in the way that I want to do it when I want to do it. Okay, that principle shows up. And as an aside, I just want to say this in the context of this church. I know you guys have a, a, a counseling culture here, but this is why premarital counseling is so important. If you know a couple who is considering getting engaged, or if you, or if you are a couple who is engaged or uh, newly married and you didn't do premarital counseling, or you're thinking maybe I should, or you know somebody who's not sure if they're going to do premarital counseling, I want to appeal to you to do it. Because here's what I have found in several years of doing premarital and pre-engagement counseling is that most couples, young couples, enter into marriage with a pornified understanding of sex. A pornified understanding of sex. Even if they grew up in the church, you have to understand that the next generation, they're just seeing porn even if they don't want to see it. It's, it's, it's coming for them. And it's shaping the way that they view sex, and it actually can bring so much trouble in the first year or two of marriage. So based on the above principles, let me give you four biblical priorities for sex, okay? Four biblical priorities for sex that I think you have to take into the marriage bed as you're having intimacy as a married couple. First, Biblical priority is service, not selfishness. Service, not selfishness. So, number one priority for husband and wife as they walk into the bedroom is I want to serve my spouse first and not be served. So both of you, this is where you get into the Romans 12 stuff where you're outdoing each other and showing honor. There's like this like godly competition happening of I want to serve you. No, you want to serve me. No, I'm going to serve you. That is actually this like happy game that we're playing in the church and in the Christian life is to serve others more than we want to be served and they're doing the same with us. Listen to how Paul applies this into in the marriage bed, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 3, and 4. He says, the husband should, now listen to this language, give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the, hus the wife to her husband. Listen to this. This is so striking. The wife 
does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. So the priority here is on serving one another with our bodies. So Paul's saying, your body, if you're a Christian, doesn't belong to you. It was purchased by God so that you would glorify him. And through the Holy Spirit inspiring Paul, he writes that one of the purposes of your body, if you're married, is to give it away to your spouse to serve them in sex. And your spouse is called to do the exact same thing with you. You give yourself to one another, okay? There's another picture of this, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Paul writes, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Husbands and wives are not allowed to do anything motivated by selfishness in the marriage bed. That's so different from our world. It's sinful to be motivated by just getting as much out of this for me as I possibly can when I'm married. This is about me. This is about me experiencing maximum pleasure. Paul says you're not allowed to do that. You can't do anything from selfish ambition or conceit. You have to count your spouse as more significant than yourselves. You're not allowed to do anything from selfishness in the bedroom. You have to count your spouse as more significant than yourself. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Love does not insist on its own way. When we enter into the marriage bed and we're insisting on our own way, we are not loving. So, First priority we walk into the bedroom is I'm here to serve, not to be selfish. Second priority entering into the bedroom is faith, not doubt. Faith, not doubt. Everything you do in the marriage bed must be done in faith. So listen to Romans 14, 23. Whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Paul is here is talking to the Roman church who's fighting with each other about, can we eat these foods that have been sacrificed to idols? Some of you will be familiar with this. And there's some people like, oh yeah, you can definitely do that. There's other people that are like, no, you can't do that. And Paul says, hey, the most important thing here is that you do what you do in faith. Okay, so if you, if you believe that it's sinful to eat this food sacrificed to idols, and you do it anyway, that's sinful. If you believe, this is just food for Paul, so it's not anything, you can eat this food. If you believe that you can bring glory to God while you do this, then do it in faith, you can eat this. He says anything that doesn't proceed from faith is sin. If your conscience is bothered by something you are doing, as though it is not pleasing to God, then you shouldn't do it. That applies significantly to what is done in the bedroom. So if your spouse wants to do something in the bedroom that you cannot do in faith, you cannot do it, okay? If you believe this is wrong and sinful, I can't do this, then it is sinful for you to do it. And you should not act against your conscience. And listen to me, you should not be forced to act against your conscience, okay? You should not be forced to act against your conscience. But let me say something else about this. The Bible also teaches that your conscience needs to be informed. Okay? I know this to be true. Let me just give you a very real example. Taylor Taylor and I have known women who go are nervous about their wedding night because they grew up in such a legalistic church context that they were told their entire life that sex was dirty and wrong. So just having sex feels sinful, okay? Even when they're married and it's pleasing to the Lord. Just just having sex is this nerve-wracking and dirty and thing that makes me feel shameful and guilty because all my life I've only been taught not to do it. I haven't been taught about God's positive vision for it. 
Well, what happens in that moment is not that the answer is, well, then you should just never have sex. No, that sister needs to have her conscience informed and shaped by Scripture, right? Scripture has to be the thing that's forming us. So a lot of the times we think about Scripture forming us as, as showing us more of what we shouldn't do. But sometimes, for those of us who grew up in legalistic backgrounds like me, you have to have Scripture free you up to show you the things that you can do and should do, not just in the marriage bed, but just in any area of the Christian life. This is something that we have to do, is, is have faith as we enter into the marriage bed. We have to be informed by Scripture. Each spouse should believe that what is happening in the bedroom is pleasing to God, glorifying Him, and a gift for them to enjoy with freedom and gratitude. One acid test for this is, can I thank God for this with a clear conscience? Can I thank God for this with a clear conscience? This is also the way I almost make any media choice. This isn't, this isn't about what we're talking about. Any media choice, movie, music, whatever, as I'm consuming this thing, can I thank God for this with a clear conscience? It's a really great metric. And if you're honest with yourself, there's a whole lot you can't thank God for with a clear conscience that you watch on TV. Third priority. Third priority. Love, not harm. Love, not harm. This is well where I'm going to exhibit my commitment to be PG. But I assume you'll be able to read between the lines here. Um, in our pornified world, and it is pornified, there are expressions of sexuality that are unnatural and harmful to people. And that's obviously forbidden by Scripture. It just is. I mean, just basic principles. Luke 6, 31. As you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. You don't want anybody to harm you, to harm your body. Nothing that happens in the bedroom for the Christian should harm another person. And no spouse should ask a spouse to do something that would endanger them. Now, I'm aware here that there are people in this room who sex is very difficult for you for all kinds of medical and physical reasons. And I'm not talking about that. I would encourage you that maybe you've never ever talked with a medical professional about sex being difficult for you, and you should. As you, if you would reach out to another mature Christian couple about this, the advice that they should give you is, hey, you need to go to a doctor and you need to talk to them about why sex is so difficult for you physically. I'm aware that there are people in this room that are like that, and I would encourage you to go talk to your doctor as soon as you can about this to, to see how you can actually address it. Nevertheless, when we're in the bedroom, our goal if everything is normal, is to never bring any harm on our spouse physically that, that, we, that we could do by any action. We want to preserve and love and be gentle with one another, care for one another as we would care for our own bodies. Fourth priority. Fourth priority. Maybe the most important one for the people in this room. Communication, not silence. Communication, not silence. One of the primary places, watch this happen over and over again, one of the primary places that Christian couples get in trouble sexually, which we'll talk about in a moment, is in communication. It's in the communication department, okay? So there's just these silent expectations that fill up your marriage, right? It's not just in sex. It's all kinds of things. Like the classic scenario is the guy that's like trying to figure out what his wife is indicating to him through body language and silence, right? We all know what this is like. Or you as a husband, you've got silent expectations that you've never expressed to anybody before, but you're living inside of them and you're frustrated when they don't get met. One spouse expects sex to be a certain level of frequency and another spouse expects something else. One spouse expects spontaneity, but that stresses the other one out. The man wants one thing, the woman wants another thing. What in the world should we do about this? This really profound idea. You should talk about it. <laughs> and I know it's funny, but it is stunning how many couples never talk about it. Instead, you're just mad at each other or you're frustrated. And you might be thinking like, wait, so you said talk about it like all of it? 
Yeah, you should talk about all of it with your spouse. Uh, my co-author, Sean, in the, in the marriage book, the blue one, um, he, wrote a, he wrote several chapters on sexual difficulty that I would commend to you. It's honestly, it's worth the price of the book, his chapters on sex. He has sexual difficulty for women, sexual difficulty for men, and then several just general chapters to couples. Um, but he wrote a chapter in our book on the, in the first years of marriage, and he talks about four ways to talk about sex. Four ways to talk about sex. Number one is your wants. Your wants. Number two is worries. Number three is ways. And number four is wise. So wants, worries, ways, and wise. Wants, worries, ways, and wise. Let me just briefly walk through them. Just, just, these are just some anchors that you could have a conversation. Actually, I challenge you in your notes to have this conversation with your spouse around these four topics. So what are your wants and desires in your sexual relationship? You should have that conversation with your spouse. What do you want? Be upfront. Be honest. And I'll just say this to the spouse. Don't judge them for what they say. You can make this conversation incredibly difficult by the way you respond to them. You know? If you've got like a husband that's saying, hey, I want to have sex with this level of frequency, don't be like, oh. don't do that. Listen, even if you're freaking out a little bit on the inside, okay? That actually leads to the next point. Then after you talk about wants, you listen, you hear. After that, you talk about worries. What are you worried about with sex with your spouse? Talk about it. Be honest. Hey, babe, listen, you just said you want to have sex six times a day. I'm just kind of worried about that. <laughs> like, like, we're not going to be able to eat. <laughs> I don't think that's probably anybody in this room. Um, you have a candid conversation with one another about what you want, but then talk about, hey, that kind of worries me. Uh, let me. Let me tell you about some of the fears that I have. Um, this is an area where people are not honest with each other. Um, hey, I really struggle to feel like I'm good enough in the marriage bed. Hey, I actually really struggle. I don't feel like, I don't feel like you want to have sex with me. Hey, I, I, I'm worried about this. Uh, can, can we talk about that? Hey, I know you had a history with pornography, and that makes me afraid. Um, have those conversations. There will be times when you're having those conversations about worry, when you're going to say, all right, and we'll, we'll talk about this in another session. This is going to now get escalated up to we need to invite somebody in to talk to us about this. That's why the, the body of Christ is here. And you can have these conversations in the context of the church. What are your worries? What are the ways you will have sex? Do you agree in the ways that you will have sex? Are they loving? Are they faith-filled? Are they God-glorifying? Are they motivated by service? And then, as you're doing those first three of wants, worries, and ways, ask the why questions throughout. Why do I want that? Why am I worried about that? Why do I want it in that way? And there can be God-glorifying reasons, servant-hearted reasons, and there can be selfish reasons. There can be selfish reasons. This is a way for spouses to fulfill Romans 12.10. Outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another in showing honor. Let me say something to the men here. Men, you should initiate this because you are the one who has the command by God to understand his wife. 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Men, you should be asking your wife questions about sex. We talk about this, I think, in our engagement book, dating book. Talk about sex before, during, and after sex. Talk about this. How was that? Oh, you, you didn't like that. Okay, hey, help me know how I can serve you. 
that may make you feel uncomfortable. And the reason it makes you feel uncomfortable maybe is because you just haven't talked about it before. This will help you and it serves and it demonstrates men a heart of service to your wife in the marriage bed. All right, let's look at question number three quickly. The third question is what is permissible in sex? What is permissible in sex? And we won't spend a ton of time here, but this is a very important question. And it's third for a reason. Only when you know your principles about sex from Scripture and your priorities for sex are shaped by Scripture can you actually answer a question like what is permissible in sex by Scripture. A lot of people approach this of what is permissible in sex in Scripture, and people are like, I mean, just whatever I want. No, no, no. There's a tremendous amount of freedom in the bed, according to Scripture, but that's not the way we approach this. We don't approach this by our own understanding. We say, okay, I'm going to submit myself to the Bible, and the Bible is going to tell me what's permissible here. Um, So I'm going to be discreet, and I'm going to keep this PG, uh, like I said at the beginning. Uh, But let me just share with you in like a sentence uh, what my conviction is about what's permissible in sex. So here's the the sentence I would say. Uh, My position is that if the Bible does not forbid something related to sex, then it is permitted as long as it does not violate other biblical principles or parameters. Okay? So if the Bible doesn't forbid something related to sex, then it is permitted as long, this is really important, as long as it does not violate other biblical principles or parameters. So this is why I covered the principles first. It's why I cover these priorities first. Because if it's violating faith, not doubt, if it's violating selfishness, not service, if it's violating love, not harm, then it's violating a biblical priority and you shouldn't do it, right? But if it's not, The Bible gives freedom here. So think about this with me for a minute, about what's permissible in the bedroom. You should be asking these types of questions when you're thinking about, can we do this, or can't we do this, or what do we think about this, or what do we think about that? So ask these questions. Can I serve my spouse if we do this? Like, you should ask, does does my spouse actually enjoy this? Or is this about me? Is this about me? Will this sexual activity cause harm to my spouse, or even potential harm? to my spouse. Can I do this in faith, in the Lord, with gratitude to him for it? Is anything we are doing here forbidden somewhere else in scripture? Those are the types of questions you should be thinking as you're evaluating, okay, is this permissible in the bedroom? So this is where you have to deploy your convictions and your priorities that are soaked in scripture in marriage, okay? And if you would like to think about this more, Uh, There's a handful of books over there that would be really, really helpful for you. Any of the marriage books on those tables over there will help you think about this. There's also several chapters, like I mentioned, in our marriage book on these topics written by um, my co-author, Sean. But let me finish uh, by just saying this as a summary on what's permissible in sex. Once you and your spouse communicate honestly and openly about your sexual relationship, examining it through the principles that have been laid out, the Bible gives you freedom to enjoy sex within marriage. It's glorious. It's wonderful. It's a gift. It's something to be explored. It's something that God wants you to enjoy in the context of marriage. I really want to trumpet this for you, okay? Because so much, this one of the things I think that's happened in the last 50 years that we have to undo is we really do, and the church have only talked about sex as something in negative terms, And we have to be really careful that we don't let the culture set the agenda in the way we talk about sex. We can be constantly on the defensive of not this, not that. Um, You talk to your teenagers about sex, and you got to be really careful. You shouldn't only be talking to them and be like, don't have it. Don't do it. Well, yes, you need to say that to them. But you also, you, you should follow Proverbs 5 as a template. You know what happens in Proverbs 5? The father looks at his son, and he's like, let me tell you about the forbidden woman. And it's very instructive. He actually acknowledges that the forbidden woman is desirable. Did you know? He says, it's like, it's sweet, like honey. And then he says, well, let me tell you the result of this, though. It's going to lead to your destruction. But then he turns the corner, and he says, rejoice in your wife sexually. 
He gives this incredible positive portrait of sex. We need to be discipling our kids like this. Hey, let me warn you against, about sex, about pornography, about the things that will really destroy you. But then let me give you a really positive portrayal of sex that the Bible gives us. The Bible actually says a way better word about sex than the world does. The reason why many teenagers, college students believe uh, that the world has something better to say about sex is because they think the Bible's silent on it. It's not. God created us. Talk to your kids. Talk to your spouse about sex. Don't be silent about this. Something will fill the vacuum if you are. Somebody's discipling your kids about sex. Just know that. It's not you. It's somebody. Someone's going to get discipled by it. So take control of that. That was an aside. Didn't plan on saying any of that, but it's important. Okay, last question. The last question is, how will we handle problems with sex? How will we handle problems that we have with sex? And the way I want to talk about this is I want to return to those scenarios, okay? Because these first three questions give you a template for how you're going to deal with stuff, okay? These principles and priorities are meant to be a grid through which you can take the sexual difficulty you're experiencing or someone that you're caring for is experiencing and use them in your relationship and in your marriage. So uh, let me just return to some of these scenarios. What do you say to your spouse or what should we say if one person wants to have sex and the other person doesn't want to have sex? I imagine you've never experienced that before in your life, but some people really do experience this. What would you say? How do you handle this? Well, let's think back to the priorities that we just discussed. So I'm not going to give you a simple yes or no. Tell them they need to have sex or tell them they need to get it under control. No. Think about this biblically for a minute. There's also unique factors here, but this is why we take principles and priorities and we put them together and we, when we think about our individual lives. That's wisdom. So first, both spouses should be thinking in that moment when, the, when like the husband and wife are staring at each other and one of them wants to have sex and the other one doesn't. And everything kind of goes into slow motion. And you're waiting to see what's, who's going to move first. Okay? What, what do you do? The thing that both spouses should be thinking about reflex by the power of the Holy Spirit is, okay, I want to serve. I want to serve. Not just the spouse who doesn't want to have sex, but also the spouse that does. When they sense, okay, you don't want to have sex, I do. I don't want to have sex, you do. And then the next thought is, okay, I want to serve. I want to serve. Paul would command the spouse with no sexual desire to be willing to love and serve their spouse with their body, even if they're tired, even if they're not in the mood. That's a way to serve your spouse. Yes. And he would also command the spouse that desires to have sex with his spouse, to count his spouse more significant than himself. You count your spouse as more significant than yourself. And that means you want to outdo your husband or your wife in showing honor to them of, hey, you know what? You, 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 I can tell you don't want to have sex. And you know, I'm going to serve you right now. I'm going to serve you right now and say, we don't have to do this right now. I love you. I want to serve you as more significant than me, to be willing to lay down your desire to serve your spouse. Each person should want to be serving one another. Second way to apply this is you want to encourage biblical communication in that moment. So the heart posture is, I want to serve, whether I want to or don't want to. I want to serve. Then you encourage biblical communication in that moment. You got to talk. Our hearts are to serve. And so it's like, so the spouse that doesn't want to have sex is like, babe, I'm, I'm just going to be honest. I, I really don't want to have sex right now. I really don't want to. I love you. I just don't want to right now. Right? So you just be honest. You don't escalate it to a fight. You always want to have sex. No, no, no. Just honest communication. I'm going to talk about this. We're going to have a bigger conversation maybe of like, okay, let's talk about frequency here of sex. What are we expecting? What are we, what are we wanting? 
Uh, what is the expectation? Hey, let's make sure we agree on this. And each couple is going to come to a different agreement here based on their life circumstances, based on desire. But the biblical ideal here is that sex would be frequent and regular. Um, and this also can involve getting help from another Christian couple. We'll talk about this in a later session. And then now let's go to scene number two. Scene number two. How do we talk to our friend in the coffee shop whispering to us about what's permissible in the bedroom? Outside of whispering. How do we uh, do this? Um, we can't lean on our own wisdom, right? If you're trying to help somebody think about their sexual relationship, you cannot think about your own wisdom. Um, we want to ask our friend what concerns them about what they're disagreeing about, okay? What's your concern? What are you worried about with this thing that your spouse wants to do that you don't want to do? Does it cause physical harm? Then there's a really obvious answer from Scripture. No! You're nervous about that because you should be nervous about that. Don't do it! And let me talk to your husband or wife, and they need to know, like, hey, you should not want that. You need to love and not harm. But you can also be thinking and listening, okay, is their conscience informed by Scripture right now? What are they being informed by in, in what they're wanting? or what they're concerned about? Are their concerns free from the corrupting licentiousness of the world's view of sex? And also, are their concerns free from unbiblical rules and regulations? Are, are they and their spouse honestly communicating with one another? It would be a problem if that friend came up to you and they're like, I haven't really talked to my husband about this, but I just want to talk to you. And if they have no plan to talk to their spouse about this, if they have no plan to talk to their wife about this, then you want to encourage them, hey, I want to talk to you about this so that you can have a conversation about, with, with your spouse about this. They need to have a friend or a pastor walking with them. You may not be, be able to arrive at an answer right then with your friend, but you can't help them find a way forward. Last scene. It's the scene of you in the car. Okay, you in just a couple of hours. I just want to encourage you that your principles about sex have to really control you as you talk about this with your spouse. Sex is meant to strengthen and display your covenant of marriage. Sex is meant to be enjoyed as a gift. Sex is meant to display the glory of God. It's so important. And you also must have to have a priority of communication. If you've never talked to your spouse about sex before, with biblical parameters, I want to encourage you that this weekend should be the weekend that you do it. We even put questions in your book to just facilitate a conversation here, an initial conversation. If you've never had this conversation before, you should have a conversation about this. Maybe you just start with these categories of wants and ways and whys. Don't be afraid to honestly share your preferences, your ideas, things you don't like or things you like. You are one flesh. It might be awkward, but it will help you serve each other. And as you do that, uh, what you'll find, by God's grace, is you'll find yourself loving your spouse more, having a deeper desire to serve them, and really, by God's grace, you'll have a closer relational intimacy and physical intimacy as well. Okay, so there's a lot more to talk about here, and I'd encourage you and your spouse to continue the conversation together. Um, I, uh, I think that book table over there, I just, I just looked at it before this session to make sure there's some good, good, good books talking about this over there, there and there are. Um, I would really encourage you to, to actually, if this isn't an area where you've had regular conversations, you've not put thought together as a couple, that this is an area where I just want you to know the Bible is sufficient to speak to, and you can get real help uh, from the resources even over there. Um, before we end, I just want to end by noticing that all of this reflects the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's just zoom in on one passage. I want you to remember this. I want you to consider that Jesus is a model of the type of humility and service that we've talked about. So Philippians 2, 2 through 8. Let me read this. We've already touched on this a little bit, but I want to end here. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now listen to our Savior. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, 
even death on the cross. The cross is the place of ultimate service and humility and counting others as more significant than yourselves. And we can glorify that together and how we love each other sexually. That is the heart of why you would dig into all of these details, why you would think about how to communicate. What will we say to each other? What are my wants and what are my worries and why do I want this? It's all a heart that's meant to demonstrate who Jesus is and what he has done. And we're actually going to pivot after this session and talk about how to do that in more detail when we think about serving each other. So why don't I pray and then we'll take a quick break. I think uh, Kirby will come up and tell us what we're doing next and then we'll dig into the next session where we're going to talk about how to serve. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray, Lord, that these detailed conversations that we're having about sexuality and how to love each other physically, Lord, would be something that would spur on conversations that would grow couples in their love for one another, that would grow couples in their honesty with one another, that you you would grow these couples, Lord, in their confidence in your word to address these issues from scripture. Lord, I pray that Jesus would be glorified in the way that we think about our lives, our bodies, our sexuality, and that we would rejoice in the gift you've given us and enjoy it in the way that you designed it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.